All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Happy Friday, all you magnificent melon heads out there. Today is February 16th, 2024. And the top story this morning was pretty hard to pick. I got two big ones going on today. First one on probably on most people's minds is PPI or the producer price index. That's another measure of inflation. It was just released a few moments ago. And much like CPI, hotter than expected, significantly hotter than expected. Inflation is resurgent. We are seeing a second wave of inflation, or at least the early innings of a second wave of inflation. And it is really denting this narrative that the Fed pivot is coming along any day now. It's This is very poorly timed. We had this monster run in the bond market since the, pretty much Halloween. At the end of October, I remember, uh, oh, what's his name? The guy, I really can't stand him. He announced he was covering his short in U.S. bonds. And then everybody took that as a signal to pile into the bond market that the Fed was going to pivot as soon as March. Interest rates started to plummet. Bond prices were rising. The stock market went ballistic, obviously. And, well, looks like that may have been a little premature because all of a sudden inflation is starting to head in the wrong direction. And, well, if we're looking for an excuse to cut rates, you're not finding it. PPI came in at 0.3% month over month. That is triple the 0.1% that was expected. And that is up sharply from the negative 0.1% month over month we had last month. Inflation is moving in the wrong direction. Notably, services. We saw a lot of inflation in services in this PPI report. Uh, goods were down. Most of the commodities were down. Uh, but core PPI remains stubbornly high. It's heading in the wrong direction. And if you guys are sitting there saying, "When is where's my March rate cut? It's not happening, guys. Uh, or, or as I love to say, this March rate cut, is it in the room with us now? Well, don't tell that to America's banks because America's banks have piled into debt instruments. They tried to front run this Fed rate cut that was coming as soon as March. They may have just screwed themselves. An article out in Bloomberg this morning says banks have started to pile back into debt instruments. And it's pretty obvious that they were hoping to buy those things while interest rates were high. And then when the Fed lowered rate cuts, well, they would make a whole bunch of money back. But now it looks like those rate cuts are going to take a while to get here. And without those rate cuts, those debt instruments are just sitting there full of risk. And, well, default risk is rising in virtually every corner of the economy. So the risk profile at our banks just got a little bit worse. And the other really big story this morning is Deutsche Fondbrief Bank. And I struggle every time I say that. I'm in my head saying Deutsche Fondbrief Bank. It's it's a mouthful, guys. Try to say it 10 times fast. Or, seriously, it's, it's a mouthful. Deutsche Fondbrief Bank. They were downgraded by S&P. They had their credit rating cut because of exposure to U.S. commercial real estate. Hmm. Speaking of those banks that were piling into risky credit instruments ahead of a Fed rate pivot, ooh, well, Deutsche Fondbrief Bank, that's not going so well for them. Their bonds are now trading at just 45 cents on the dollar. According to the debt at Deutsche Fondbrief Bank, this bank is toast. It is trading at junk rates. This is starting to, this is a, a large German bank, not a freaking Chinese property developer we're talking about here. They're in big trouble over there. Also, we have got a, an interesting short report was issued by Wolfpack Research yesterday. They're a, a short selling firm. These guys, they take out short bets against companies that they think are fraudulent, and then they release their findings to the public which usually tanks their share prices. They are self-interested because they are they take out the positions before they release it. But these guys kind of fancy themselves as the fraud investigators of Wall Street. There is money to be made in identifying fraud, and so that's what these guys do. They came out with a note on InnoData yesterday, ticker I-N-O-D, which is another one of these uh, much lower profile but AI hype machines. InnoData is supposedly this uh, you know data analytics firm and they've been saying, we're using artificial intelligence and all the big tech companies want to consult with us and we're doing great things. AI, 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 of course. And well, Wolfpack Research says this company is all smoke and mirrors, that it's really nothing more than a manual data entry firm, that these guys use cheap labor in foreign countries and they just have people just pounding away at keyboards in these massive cubicle farms and the data that they the changes they make, the data entry that they do, that that is being sold like it's artificial intelligence spitting this stuff out. 
And laughably, Wolfpack Research found that this company had spent more money on press releases in the last few years than they had on research and development, all while claiming they're the next big thing in AI. A lot going on in the world today. Oh, also real estate. Oh, what, what happened? I mean, it got lost in all the noise about PPI this morning. Housing starts in the United States way down, way down. Now, when I say way down, for single-family homes, they were down a decent clip, and the market was expecting them to rise. But multifamily housing starts dropped 35.8% in the last month. That's seasonally adjusted, guys. So it's not like, oh, you know, the weather or anything like that. And look, the weather was good in January. So if anything, you should have had more. 35.8% decline in multifamily housing st starts last month. Um, I got to send a shout out to my buddy Travis at Real Estate Mindset, Melody Wright, Todd Sachs, Real Estate Ninja, all those, all those real estate channels. Guys, sink your teeth into this one. Something just happened in the housing market. I don't know enough about it. I'll be honest with you. I don't spend that much time in the real estate space to really say with certainty what is going on there. But these numbers are meant to be seasonally adjusted. That is a massive decline that we just saw. So much data to go through. So little time. Why don't we shrink my big melon of head and see what's going on in the market? Guys, don't forget that like button and subscribe and hit that notification bell too if you're new here. It really helps with the YouTube algorithm and have your coffee with the melon heads every morning. Now, before I get into the markets, I have to mention this one because I did that video yesterday about the decline in lead times for NVIDIA's GPUs. And in that video, I mentioned that the only way we could see a decline in lead times without a decline in demand would be if there was some surge in efficiency at Taiwan Semiconductor, which is the company that makes the things. And I pointed to the CapEx at Taiwan Semiconductor, which has been falling for three consecutive years now, to say, well, if their CapEx is falling, then there probably hasn't been any big efficiencies or any big breakthroughs in manufacturing. And well, I guess there was a little bit of confirmation bias on my part there because, yeah, CapEx would be an indicator of efficiency improvements. Big surges in CapEx do eventually lead to breakthroughs in efficiency, but it's not 100% correlation. And I had a couple of people sent me this one on X last night in response to that video. And I felt it was important enough to mention today, Taiwan Semiconductor boosts their AI packaging capacity to 15,000 wafers per month, according to a report. This is back in November of last year, and this is in WCCF Tech. Now, this is a pretty obscure media outlet. It's very specialized. This didn't get any coverage in the mainstream press. So I'm not sure I would have found this one anyway if I had really kept peeling on that Taiwan Semiconductor CapEx. Uh, but shout out to the guys on Fintwit. I mean, they, they're they sharp. They know their stuff, and they, they called this one out. So I just want to mention this. Taiwan Semiconductor, TSMC, has increased its chip on wafer on substrate or COWOS capacity in response to strong orders from NVIDIA, according to su supply chain reports in Taiwan. TSMC, the world's largest chip manufacturer, is a key NVIDIA supply chain partner for the latter's advanced AI chips. Also, one of the key bottlenecks due to capacity constraints is packaging technology. And they go on in this article to mention that NVIDIA is believed to account for about 40% of Taiwan Semiconductor's total COWOS production capacity. And so if TSMC is increasing their production capacity for their packaging of these AI wafers, well, then it stands to reason that some of that increased capacity would be allocated to NVIDIA. And therefore, it is plausible, dare I say probable, that a decline in the lead times for NVIDIA chips could at least be partially explained by this increase in efficiency of Taiwan Semiconductor's packaging capacity. Uh, so it this is important enough to mention. It's, the, it's not so cut and dry when I pointed to the CapEx as an excuse to say, hey, there is no increase in production capacity. That is not entirely accurate because there has been increases in capacity, and it looks like it's going to affect NVIDIA. Does it explain? that all of a sudden there's openings at the end of this year? In my opinion, no. Does it explain why the prices are about to plummet according to Databricks? No. So I don't think this flies in the face of the entire premise of the video, but this is important enough to mention, and that's why it's the first thing I'm going to cover on my live stream today. All right, with that being said, let's look at what's going on in markets. The S&P 500 is down just three points ahead of the opening bell. It was up a couple of dozen points at one point. It sold off a little bit on that PPI news. 
We had a big red candle as soon as PPI came down. It's bouncing now right about even on the day. The Dow is, uh, well, I didn't adjust my charts. I am remiss this morning. The Dow is currently down 105 points ahead of the opening bell, about a quarter of 1%. Same shape on the chart there. Sold off initially on PPI, catching a little bit of a bounce. And the NASDAQ is currently up 36 points or 0.2%. Same shape of the chart, but NASDAQ doing a little better, clinging to positive territory this morning. But we got two of the three indexes are down, hence the bear in the thumbnail. Looking over at the U.S. dollar, we have got a slightly slightly stronger dollar up by 20 basis points this morning or 0.19% higher at 104.49. And, uh, well, interestingly, we had a big spike up. We got up to 104.65, and then we popped right back down to 104.5. A lot of volatility in the Dixie chart right now. Not sure what not sure what made this big jump right here and then, and then to cut right back. Uh, but a stronger dollar, this is reflecting a less dovish Fed. This is the market repricing expectations for that March, and dare I even say that May rate cut from the Federal Reserve now. If those are less likely, then we're looking at a stronger dollar this morning. And we're also looking at sharply higher interest rates across the board. The 30-year Treasury is at 4.46. That's up four basis points this morning. The 10-year, 4.313. That's up seven and a half points. Check out the two-year, up 10 basis points, 4.676. Actually, it's up almost 11 basis points here this morning. Interest rates are rising. Even the one month getting in on the action, up one point to 5.39%. So the price of a dollar is going up. The price to borrow a dollar is going up. Commodities, probably not going to like that. April gold futures, $2,011. That's down $3.65, about 0.2% lower this morning. March silver futures, 2309. That's actually up 14 cents or 0.61%. So silver is doing remarkably well, considering we got a stronger dollar and higher interest rates this morning. Platinum is down a quarter of a percent. Palladium, a little less than 1% to the downside. Uh, March crude oil futures for West Texas Intermediate at 78.73. That's up about 70 cents or 0.9% this morning. Oil is pushing that $80 threshold. Uh, it looks like Supply disruptions, the resurgent inflation may be driving oil prices higher. Still, there's concerns about the Red Sea. That's putting upward pressure on prices. But at the same time, the deflation in China, the global recession. Yesterday, we talked about how Germany, Japan, the UK, and China, four of the six largest economies in the world are deep in recession now. So you've got the demand destruction versus supply disruption argument going on right now, at least for today. Supply disruption is in the driver's seat. Oil is heading higher. Now, let's talk a little bit about this PPI. Guys, this was not good this morning. If you're hoping for that March rate cut, well, this one just really put a damper in your plans. Producer prices for final demand in the U.S. were up 0.3% month over month in January. That's the biggest increase in five months, following a 0.1% decline in December and compared to forecasts of 0.1%. The cost of services rose 0.6%. Now, this is interesting, guys, because when I first saw this spike in PPI after the spike in CPI, my initial thought was maybe this is the Red Sea. Maybe this is the Houthis and the ships taking the long way around Africa. Maybe that's finally driving up costs. But no, that's not what's going on here. It's all services. Services rose 0.6%, the largest increase since July. Services doesn't really depend on ships sailing around Africa. You know, that led by a 2.2% gain in prices for hospital outpatient care. Uh, that's probably a lot of these people having elective procedures. We've talked about how health care is getting more expensive. Health insurance is getting more expensive, even though laughably they changed the CPI measurement for health insurance to show a double-digit decline in health insurance premiums. Uh, but a lot of people, now that the uh, the woohoo bat flu is behind us, they are opting to get these elective procedures. That's causing crowding in hospitals, and it's driving up the cost of health care. We're seeing that in PPI today. We've also got the cost of chemicals, allied products wholesaling, machinery and equipment wholesaling, portfolio management, traveler accommodation services, legal services, all moving higher. On the other hand, the price of goods declined 0.2%. So again, if, if you're thinking this is because of the Houthis and the Red Sea thing, no, goods are down. Services is driving this one. The fourth consecutive drop in goods that was led by a 3.6% fall in gasoline. 
Prices for electric power, hay, hay seeds, oil seeds, beef and veal, ethanol, iron, steel scrap, all moved lower. So all the commodities, all the commodities in the PPI, all lower. All the goods in PPI, lower. It's the services. It's the cost of labor, I guess, is really what's driving this up. Uh, some interesting things, some interesting trends playing out in the PPI today. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I need a little bit more time to marinate on this and think about what this means. Maybe we'll get into this in more detail in my live stream this afternoon as we wrap up this week. But this was a bit of a shocker. I kind of figured we'd come in a little bit higher. But to go from negative 0.1 month over month to negative to positive 0.3, that is a big swing in inflation. It's all being driven by services, partially offset by goods and commodities. Uh, also, we're looking here at core PPI, less food and energy. Core PPI in the U.S. rose 2% year over year for the corresponding period versus uh, a year ago in January. That's accelerating from the 1.8% increase we saw in December. So core is a little higher. Um, what else do we have here? We got month over month core PPI was up 0.5%. That's versus a 0.1% expected. So this just blew away expectations. It's also up from a negative 0.1. Uh, really interesting stuff happening in inflation here, guys. Is this the start of the second wave of inflation, or is this just noise in the chart? We need more data here. But I got to say here, looking right now, this is at CME's Fed Watch tool. This is the likelihood of the Federal Reserve making an interest rate cut in March. It is now down to just 8.5%. You now have more than 90% likelihood that there is no rate cut in March. Uh, I just want to point out, guys, that a month ago, in on January 16th, that was 63% likelihood of a cut in March. It is now just eight and a half. And yet the stock market has just gone straight up the whole time. The market is way off sides on this Fed pivot here. All right. And uh, also the May likelihood of a rate cut. All right. That's still... A 68.4% odds now that they don't even cut in May. So now it's it's now an underdog. The May rate cut is now an underdog. A few months ago, March was a sure thing. Now we're not even sure about May. We've got, what, a 31% likelihood of either a 25 or a 50 basis point cut in May now. So the whole market is repricing their expectations. It's probably not going to be a very good day for markets today. Unless something comes out, some Fed governor comes out and says something that flies in the face of this PPI story. Uh, not looking good here. Now, let's talk about this one. German lender PBB shares plunge after S&P cuts rating. And this story is even more poignant this morning because now that we've gotten this higher than expected inflation reading, the odds of that rate cut are less likely now. Well, Commercial real estate in the U.S. desperately needs rate cuts. And I'm not talking about a 25 basis point rate cut or even a 50. Commercial real estate needs several hundred basis points of rate cuts if it's going to survive. Because the losses on these buildings are just catastrophic. 40, 50, 60, sometimes 90% losses on these buildings and their loans without massive rate cuts. And I don't even think massive rate cuts could even solve these buildings because nobody works in them anymore. Everybody, Not everybody, but a lot of people work from home now. We just have too much of this stuff. German lender PBB shares plunge after S&P cuts their rating. We talked about Deutsche Fondbrief Bank about a week ago. They were one of the banks reporting a lot of losses from U.S. commercial real estate. Here come the ratings agencies late to the party as usual. Deutsche Fondbrief Bank shares fell more than 10% on Thursday. And the price of its debt tumbled to a record low after S&P cut its credit rating over concerns about the lender's exposure to commercial real estate. One of Germany's largest real estate financiers, the bank last week sought to reinsure investors that it had enough funds to cope with a property slump that has cast a shadow over numerous lenders. PBB has 15% of its portfolio in the U.S. real estate market, where concerns about defaults have shot up recently. Shares in PBB have now lost more than 36% of their value this year. The bank's 150 million euros 2027 bond skidded two cents to a record low of 44.8 cents on Thursday. The debt from this bank, guys, is trading at 45 cents on the dollar. And that's rounding up. 45 cents on the dollar for this German bank. We're not talking about Evergrande or, you know, a number one Chinese building maker. We are talking about 
Deutsche Fond Brief Bank here, the biggest real estate financier in Europe. Whoops. Their debt is trading at highly distressed level. The bond had traded at about 70 cents as early as last Tuesday. This thing is dropping value like crazy. But it is not just Deutsche Fond Brief Bank that you guys need to be worried about. Check out this story in Bloomberg this morning. Talk about bad timing. Banks are piling back into everything from mortgage debt to CLOs. By the way, CLO stands for Collateralized Loan Obligation. It's similar to a CMBS or a commercial mortgage-backed security. There's some subtle nuance. It's not all real estate loans and CLOs. And there's slightly different structures. It's basically securitized debt and asset-backed security. That's what a CLO is. Deposits are ticking up, giving them more money to put to work. And the return of bank buyers helps propel a broad rally in credit this one's a little dangerous here. U.S. banks are starting to ramp up purchases of everything from mortgage-backed securities to collateralized loan obligations after nearly two years of cutting back, adding fuel to a multi-month rally across credit markets. We've been talking about how since the end of October, beginning in November, credit markets have rallied like the blazes. Interest rates have fallen. Bond prices have risen. Everybody was front-running that Fed rate cut in March. That was a sure thing. Whoops. CPI, PPI happened. But Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Bank of America have been boosting purchases of top-rated CLOs. Commercial bank holdings of mortgage bonds are also on the upswing, climbing 12 of the last 15 weeks, according to Federal Reserve data. It comes as Wall Street buyers added $41 billion of securities to their portfolios in the three months through December. That's according to data compiled by Citigroup, ending a streak that saw them shed more than $800 billion since March of 2022. That's when they started tightening according to Fed data. All of these banks, all of these Wall Street firms started piling into debt, started buying debt securities and debt instruments last fall. They kept doing it all through Christmas and into January. And now they're all saying, yeah, the Fed's going to start cutting in March and these instruments are going to go up in value when the Fed cuts. And then, oh crap, CPI hotter than expected, PPI hotter than expected, jobs reports hotter than expected, although I don't think the data really says that in the jobs reports, but the narrative is hotter than expected. Now the odds of that March rate cut, they're gone. The banks have all of this additional risk on their balance sheet, and it's not going to go up in value when they think it is. So they're just left sitting there holding that risk. And oops, defaults are rising in all of these instruments that they're now holding more of. The banks got greedy. They got ahead of themselves. They started buying up debt instruments, thinking the Fed was going to ride to the rescue. And, well, the CME futures are saying, guys, that, that might not happen when you think it's going to happen. Maybe now, not even until June. And a lot can happen in June because there's a lot of buildings defaulting. A lot of companies are losing millions, hundreds of millions of dollars on buildings. Credit card delinquencies are piling up. Nobody's paying their student loans. And the banks are just buying up debt, thinking the Fed is going to rescue them. But you know what? It's not their risk because it's not even their money. What do they care? Oh, my goodness. Good God. What is going on in America's financial system? Now let's talk about the real estate, guys. The real estate market. Housing starts in the U.S. slumped to 14.8% month over month to an annualized rate of 1.331 million in January. That is the lowest since August and missing market forecasts of 1.46. This data is pretty bad here. Look at the chart. Look at the big drop. And housing starts, all right? 1.331 million housing starts. And a housing start is basically somebody puts a shovel in the dirt, all right? You've started a house. You've got permits. That's when the paperwork gets filed. And then after the permit, then you get the start when the first guy moves that first shovel of dirt. 1.331 million, that is the annualized rate based on how many housing starts there were in January. Now, that is what the market was expecting 1.46 million. So this is a big miss on housing starts. It's way down from the 1.562 million that we had last month, down 14.8% month over month. Now, here's the kicker, guys. It's, again, the devil is in the details here. All right, this is the biggest fall since April of 2020, following a 3.3% increase in December. Single family housing starts were down 4.7%. That's a pretty bad number, right? Single family homes. They're not building as many of them, but look at this one. The rate for units in buildings with five units, i.e. multifamily real estate, plunged 35.8%. That's a month-over-month -month number. There was just a 35.8% decline 
in the number of multifamily units being started in the month of January. Now, I had my buddy Travis from Real Estate Mindset on the channel not too long ago, and we were talking about how new multifamily residential real estate is about to pile into the market. And we've been talking about how New York Community Bank is getting crushed because of this rent-controlled multifamily residential real estate. And now all of a sudden, we've got a 35.8% decline in new construction on multifamily real estate or housing starts. Maybe new construction isn't the best way to describe that. Uh, guys, multifamily residential has been the silver lining of the commercial real estate world for the last year and a half. While we've been talking about office buildings are being are falling like cheaper than dirt and how we have way too much retail space because people do their shopping online now instead of going to stores. We've been saying all along, well, at least multifamily residential is strong. We still have a housing shortage and rents are still so high. So at the very least, all of commercial real estate isn't totally hosed. Well, we just saw a major reduction in new multifamily residential construction. I don't know, is this finance related? Are these builders suddenly unable to get loans or did they suddenly realize, oh my God, guys, we're building so many of these things in all these states across the country. We better stop before we crash the market. I don't know what happened, but that is a huge reduction in housing starts for units, buildings with five units or more, i.e. multifamily residential. That's what's driving this big drop in housing starts. Single family down 4.7, multifamily down 35.8. Yikes. That's a big deal. Hey, Travis, Melody, Todd, Ninja, you guys want to dig into this one and find out what's going on here? You guys are better at real estate than I am. Something is up in multifamily residential. United States building permits also declined. We had another miss in building permits. Building permits in the U.S. dropped by 1.5% to a seasonally adjusted annual rate of 1.47 million in January. That's down from 1.493 million and defying market expectations of an increase to 1.509 million. So this is a little further upstream in the housing construction process. This is the paperwork. Building permits, when you file with the township, I, well, I wanna start this new project. First, you file the paperwork. A few months later, you put a shovel in the ground. We saw a big decline in people putting a shovel in the ground, a massive decline, but a smaller decline in people filing the permits. So maybe the fact that permits aren't down quite as much, maybe this is like, okay, Jack, cool it a little bit. Yeah, it's down, but it's not down the 35% we saw in multifamily. But again, there's some important details in here. Uh, let's see, approvals for the volatile multifamily segment or multi-segment decreased by 7.9% to a rate of 455,000, while single family authorizations rose by 1.6%. So again, we got a big delta here, a big difference between multifamily and single family. Building permits for single family actually went up by 1.6%, but multifamily decreased by 7.9, a big drop. So this data point, although not as alarming as the housing starts data, I see the same trend. Single family, not great, but not terrible. Multifamily, WTF just happened in multifamily real estate because approvals for volatile multi-segment decreased by 7.9%. Big drops going on in multifamily residential. Keep your eye on that one. And another one I want to talk about here, guys. Check this one out. This is from Wolfpack Research. This is a short-selling firm. They released a report yesterday on ticker INOD, or Inodator, exposing Inod's smoke and mirrors AI. And, man, I was just loving this report. And I think you're going to see a lot more of this. Remember yesterday we talked about that note from the SEC from Gary Gensler warning companies about making unrealistic promises about AI and overhyping artificial intelligence. On the same day that note from the SEC comes out, Wolfpack Research releases this one. Check this out. We are short in a data. That's Wolfpack, not me. I have no position in this. Because despite management's pumping that it is delivering the promise of AI to many of the world's most prestigious companies, it is a deteriorating manual data entry business driven by offshore labor, not innovation. These guys are hiring people in poor countries to manually enter data, and they're selling it like it's this groundbreaking artificial intelligence platform. I'm not used to, I'm not used to disclose their R&D 
spend in let me start this paragraph over. iNod used to disclose their R&D spend in their quarterly earnings press releases, but iNod's R&D spend apparently fell so low after the first quarter of 2021 that the company stopped disclosing it entirely. However, iNod has disclosed spending a grand total of $4.4 million on R&D over the last five years and disclosed less spend on R&D in 2023 than it spent on press releases pumping its AI. It's a hype company, guys. It is smoke and mirrors. iNod's business has been slowly decaying over the last two decades as automatic data annotation has made its legacy business offshoring manual data annotation less relevant and consistently unprofitable. And iNod flat out does not have the money to pivot to AI or anything else as of Q3 23 iNod's trailing 12-month net loss was $4.5 million, and it only had $6.4 million of net working capital on its balance sheet. With $5.1 million of its cash tied up overseas and only $4.7 million of credit available, iNod cannot make any significant investments without a highly dilutive, deeply discounted equity raise, and they expect dilution soon. Prior to the AI pump, iNod had been a perennial $2 to $3 stock, partly because of the last decade, they've been consistently unprofitable. But iNod turned $32.4 million in retained earnings at the end of 2012 into $11.3 million of accumulated deficit as of the third quarter of 2023. And they expect iNod stock to return to their historically le historical levels, especially if there is a dilutive raise. In other words, AI company, they spent all this money on AI press releases more than they actually spent on research and development. And really, there's this short firm is saying it's just a bunch of people in a poor country working for pennies, cranking away at a keyboard, and they're selling it like it's artificial intelligence. And check out what iNod stock did yesterday, down 30.4% on the relief release of this news. Now, guys, just since the start of this year, all right, tell me it's a tell me it's an AI bubble without actually telling me. This company's stock on January 1st, just six weeks ago was $7.79. And before this report was released by Wolfpack, it was $12.26. In six weeks, it goes from less than $8 to over $12. And of course, it's back down to just over $8 right now, still up year to date, even though they basically just got exposed as being a fraud. They're not an AI company. It's just people pounding away on keyboards, taking advantage of cheap labor in foreign countries. Got to love this, these AI stories. They just keep getting better and better. Look for more stories like this as the curtain is pulled back on the AI hype and the AI mania. And I just want to say thank you so much. Well, first of all, M&J, thank you for gifting Nobody Special Finance channel memberships. I appreciate that very much, guys. We started doing channel memberships. that people were asked to do that recently. So you'll see that down below. Um, it is in the join button. I, somebody had a lot of trouble figuring out how to join yesterday on YouTube. Uh, it's different on every type of phone, whether you're on desktop or or mobile. And to be honest with you, it's a pain in the butt to explain it. But thank you very much, m and I appreciate that very much. And thank you, Steve Voidis, for the super chat and support of the channel. It says, our Canadian head office is closing sales at 33% of last year. Low demand in industrial automation components. Hopefully not a harbinger for U.S., uh, Steve, Canada and U.S. are hopelessly intertwined. If you guys are seeing an industrial decline in Canada, chances are we're seeing the same thing here in the States. I don't think anything happens in the States that doesn't affect Canada or vice versa, although maybe the, the U.S. probably has a bigger effect on Canada than Canada has on the U.S. But you're 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 talking that that's a very thin line between the Canada and U.S. Uh, I can tell you industrial automation, a 33 percent decline. That is in line with some of the PMIs that I've been seeing. The manufacturing PMIs are all way down. Uh, factories cutting hours. New orders are not picking up. Lead times are coming in. So a 30, I mean, sales being just 33% of last year, that's scary. That's a that's not a decline. That is a collapse. Uh, but I'm not surprised to see low demand for industrial automation components because industrial automation is not a booming sector right now. It just isn't. And that these factories are all slowing down. Global trade is slowing. Manufacturing is slowing in China and in the States and everywhere else. So uh, I'm not too surprised to see that. But that number is a big one, 33% of last year. Thank you, sir, very much for that wonderful anecdata. And, of course, for the super chat, the support of the channel. And uh, welcome, Madison Hypes, a new channel member. Thank you very much. 
And thank you to Mr. Cole Marsh for the super sticker. Cole Marsh sends, uh, what do we got? Like a Japanese, uh, is that a fox? Throwing haymakers there. Thank you very much, Cole Marsh. I appreciate that, sir. Thank you for supporting the channel and the super chat. And thank you, everybody, for having your coffee with the Melon Heads this morning. Shout out to all my channel members and Patreon supporters. Thank you guys for everything you do for the channel. I really do appreciate your support. Also, hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. I love you guys. Till next time, live small and dream big. Thank you.